Um, first and foremost is Mark Samuels, who is executive producer um, of American Experience. Mark. flagship history series in 2003 after serving as senior producer since 97. American Experience is television's most watched and longest running history series and the recipient of every major industry award including the Peabody, Primetime Emmy, Writers Guild and more. Prior to WGBH, Mark worked as an independent documentary filmmaker and executive producer for several public television stations. Also joining us is John Maggio. John, right here on the end. Uh, John is the producer and director of Billy the Kid, this documentary. He is an acclaimed writer, director, and producer of documentary films. His work includes several fil films for Frontline and The American Experience, and his films have been honored with the National Emmy Award, the Writers Guild Award, and more. His work is also premiered at the Sundance Film Festival. Also joining us, and you might recognize this face from the film, is Paul Hutton. He's an American cultural historian. Oh, let's go. go right ahead. <laughs> Paul is an American cultural historian, author, and is a professor of history at the University of New Mexico and the executive director of the Western History Association. He's written a dozen television documentaries and has appeared in over 150 television programs on PBS, CBS, the History Channel, and more. He's also served as a historical consultant for The Missing and Cowboys and Aliens. <laughs> and this evening's uh, panel discussion will be moderated by Jean Grant, another face you may know. Uh, host of journalist and columnist and has worked at the Albuquerque, Albuquerque Tribune, Albuquerque Journal, and the Weekly Alibi. He joined k and in 2005 as a regular panelist on the line and is now the sole host of k and weekly hour-long public affairs show and the only hour-long public affairs show in the state of New Mexico, New Mexico In Focus. tonight, Greg and Nicole, and joining us for this great event, and I'm going to turn it over to Jean, who's going to moderate tonight's discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Polly. She's a great boss. <laughs> <She's> <laughs> <an awesome. laughs> well, we got the winter socks on. We're all good for the... No one's, no one's shivering. Okay. We have one thing to clear up before we get started, and I'm going to do a little housekeeping as well, let you know what's going to go on tonight. It's our understanding there is someone in this room by the name of William Bonnie. <laughs> now that person, if you're willing to stand up, we'd love to know who you are. William Bonnie, where are you? Where are you, William Bonnie? Now, you don't have to be embarrassed. You're here. We had somebody ask you, right? There he is! <laughs> it's on his license. It's real. It was checked at the door. I had, a good, I had the good fortune to watch this uh, film last night, and I've got to tell you guys, it's a treat. And uh, it's especially a treat for us here in New Mexico. Uh, folks in Connecticut, Portland, Wisconsin, you know, they're going to have a great time watching this. But trust me when I tell you, there's something very special here. And I, I think there's, there's something here we're going to be proud of for a long time. There's been a lot of Billy the Kid stuff out there. And that's where I want to jump off with Mark as executive producer. And thank you for coming to Mexico, by the way. Appreciate it. How does one even, and, and of course, uh, uh, Mark and John, I want you to add in on this too, but Mark, in the overall sense, where does one start peeling the layers of Billy the Kid? Because there's been so much, there's so much written, so much out there, so much fictionalized stuff. We've had Paul Newman play Billy the Kid. We've had, I mean, we've had all these Billy the Kids out there. How do you start parsing what's real, what's for you, what's not real, what makes a good story, and how do you approach someone and work with someone like John and make this thing happen? Well, uh, I think the first thing have to have some time because it takes a, a good while to separate out all the accumulated layers of myth that surround someone like Billy the Kid. He's not the only one that's like that. We've done films on Jesse James and Wyatt or Benanny Oakley. And each one of them sort of accumulates over the centuries since they lived um, facts, some things that are people call facts, some, um, some things that people 
say are facts that are mythological, and, and then some things that are just plain hokey and, and hookah. Um, so um, it takes a while to, to peel it away. So you have consultants like Paul uh, that we hire, and uh, we usually triangulate on consultants so that we're not getting one point of view. And then we sort of, you know, rigorously sort of try to bore down to what do we know, what do we not know. And in the case of Billy, um, you know, even though there's been a lot written about him, there's not a lot that we know about him either. I mean, we don't know very much about his interior life. Uh, there's very, there's no letters to his parents, there's no letters to his sisters. You know, there's none of those kind of things that you can use to sort of shape a, a person out of, of a figure. And so you have to sort of look at him for, by what he did, um, by what happened to him, or try to shape a real live person so you could bring that person into the present. Mm -hmm. One more for you, Mark. When you, 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 you think about the roster of American experience profiles that have been done, how does Billy the Kid make the cut? And I'm curious about the internal dialogue in the American experience. What makes an iconic figure big enough that you feel it's good for an international audience? Uh, besides the obvious one being the kid, but was there other factors as well? Uh, a, a couple of things. Mm -hmm. um, one was early on, I, I actually, at the beginning, I grew up with the kid in my life, um, but I didn't know very much about it. And, and um, I assumed, or I very quickly realized that there was you know, one photograph of him, you know, one of the best <laughs> sort of scary for a movie. <laughs> <laughs> and we used it a lot. <laughs> I don't want to say overuse yet. Um, but, um, and then um, I, I guess the answer is, you know, came when um, a couple of things. One, I guess two little points early on, because, you know, I'm sitting there learning all the time about the subjects and what we should do and should do. First of all, there has to be some, um, it has to be more than just a local story. Billy the Kid comes out t to this part of the world, part of the country, at a time of tremendous change. The railroads are spreading throughout the West, mining spreading throughout the West. He comes into this fascinating intersection of the Hispanic world, the Anglo world, and the Native world. He's right in the center of it. So this is a really dynamic place at a really dynamic time in American history. So that helps. And then, secondly, I um, stumbled across an article by one of the um, interviewees in the film, Fintan O'Toole, who was a writer for the Dublin Times, and, and wrote about how Billy the Kid is also part of the ongoing war between the Irish and the English. And who would have thought that, you know, in the wilds of Mexico, that that conflict of Europe would be extended? And I thought, you know, this really is a story that's got a tremendous context, and it's also got reach, and it, it means a lot. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So, John, for you, yeah, again, how do you start your arc here to tell this story? I mean, I love going back to the, the beginnings, and I love very careful wording there. Possibly could have been from New York, and I'm going to assume no one's really quite 100% on that. But where do you start with this, and how do you? It, how much pressure is it to tell everything in 52 minutes that hasn't been told before? Well, that, that work? Yeah, that is, that is the trick. So you end up pulling a little bit closer to you. What we end up having to do, what I end up having to do, is, is figure out what I can bring to the story. Um, what, 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 what is something new I can bring to the story? And, and Mark alluded to this, and part of that is to try to pull Billy, the human being, away from the myth in some way, try to humanize him. And the way I do that, the way I start is, is meeting people like Paul, and, and, and there's another gentleman in the audience, I think, Fred, Fred Nolan. Fred, are you here? Frederick Nolan, who I met very early on, who you've seen the film, he's the English fellow, who has great things to say. And, and I'll say this, uh, when I met a group of the historians and people who are, have thought a lot about Billy, I was struck by how passionate they are about this character. I mean, incredible passion. I think you see it on the screen. When every, every sentence that's uttered about these guys it feels very loaded and heavy. So I was really moved by that. And I try to pick what they tell me. I mean, these are the guys who are do the primary research. So I stand on their shoulders and try to figure out who, who this guy is. Another big part of it for me, too, is to not just limit it to experts and historians, but to talk to storytellers and writers of fiction, because they think about Billy in a different way. They're not so much anthropologists as they are, trying to get inside of his interior life in some way. Um, and I think that helps draw Billy out and turn him into a, a human being. By the way, a quick note, uh, Denise Chavez, who you saw in the, in the 
but couldn't make it tonight. She was supposed to be up here with us. She lives in Las Cruces and was not feeling 100%. Uh, but we miss her. She's terrific in the film, by the way. She's so, she missed her insights. are so yeah. juicy. It's so wonderful. Paul, thank you for spending some time with us. Good to see you again. And uh, where should we start with Billy as a, as a historian? What have we gotten wrong? It, it, you know, it, it, every historian I know is always, you know, pretty PO'd about something they want to kind of break yeah. when, when it comes to imagery and stuff like that. Is there something that we've just gotten fundamentally wrong about Billy the Kid that that uh, we need to know a, a, a better, get a better handle on him, to get a better understanding of him? Well, I think when I first came to New Mexico now, 25, 26 years ago, um, one of the things that struck me, and I had avoided Billy the Kid uh, as a Western historian because I knew wisely that down that road lies madness. <laughs> and so I thought, I'll just skip this one. Uh, well, of course, that's, impo that's impossible to do, but I was really struck by the fact, uh, and this is what I think people get wrong about the kid, is how much hostility there was to Billy in New Mexico. And uh, certainly with the historical establishment, which I guess I'm part of, um, he was something that no one wanted to talk about, and people were always sort of PO'd that we would spend any time at all on Billy the Kid, when indeed there were so many other really important New Mexicans uh, to talk about. But actually, Billy the Kid is the most famous New Mexican that ever lived, and uh, whether we like it or not. And that's because he says so many things about the human condition. And so what we've gotten wrong about Billy is, is the same mistake that those lawmen made back in the 1870s and 80s. Uh, we have underestimated his power. And it's the power of that story that has fueled 66 films, more movies than made on any other historical character in American history. It's just incredible. Now, some of these are Billy the Kid versus Dracula, of course, but... <laughs> Even that has some merit. But you were at right? I wish I had them. I could help them on that one. Well, I actually tried on, Cow on Cowboys and Aliens. I tried to, uh, I inserted a line on Billy the Kid, but they changed it to Jesse James. Uh, yeah, I was, doing, I was doing my best. And as the historical consultant, since the film was set in 1875, it would have been totally wrong since Billy the Kid wasn't known in 1875, but I didn't care. <laughs> He goes back. I like it. <laughs> right, exactly right. Um, some of the things that, that you hear people ask about and talk about, well, let's get into some of the details of this. It's so much fun. The Brady incident. There, there was, the, what really happened there? You know, was, was Billy really going to be that much on the side of the law? for that period of time, or was that just an arrangement that was going to destined to fall apart at some level? It just went horribly wrong. How do you, how do you see the whole Brady incident there? Well, the problem for Billy was that the law in Lincoln County was totally corrupt, and um, now Sheriff Brady has descendants, one who is a well-known news lady here in, uh, here in Albuquerque, and, I'm, and they're all wonderful people. And the sheriff, <laughs> and the sheriff, and all of his descendants deserve respect. And the sheriff was a, was a union veteran of the war, and uh, but he had fallen in, let us say, with bad company, with the ring, and um, he had he had used his badge to further the uh, economic interests of uh, of uh, his friends, and uh, and in using his badge, he had also uh, hired notorious outlaws as part of the posse, which had led to the murder of the Englishman Tunstall, who was the employer of Billy the Kid, and the person that the kid was devoted to. Uh, the kid swore vengeance, and he blamed the sheriff, and rightly so, with, uh, with the killing of, uh, of his friend Tunstall, and uh, he was determined to get vengeance. And uh, once he and his compatriots killed Brady and uh, his deputy, then they really crossed a line which they could not uh, come back from. And uh, it's the key moment in, in his, uh, his life. And it's a key moment in the Lincoln County War, uh, which uh, his side loses. Uh, but the violence is so intense, and uh, the house, as it was called, the, those who had employed Brady, uh, were so corrupt that the governor of New Mexico, Lou Wallace, attempted to use the kid to get at them. But Wallace also underestimated the power uh, 
of the political system in New Mexico, and he was outmaneuvered, and there was nothing he could do against Ryerson, the corrupt DA, to uh, to get the to get the kid off. So uh, it's uh, really interesting. I, I know this will surprise everyone in this audience. There was a time when New Mexico politics were a little shady. <laughs> <laughs> John, uh, if you would set up Lincoln County, uh, what Paul just referenced, the, who was strong down there, who ran what, and how, the, all those tensions in Lincoln County at the time. Yeah, well, what, what I found incredibly fascinating when I started the story, um, and, uh, something that the historians helped me see, was that, and, and Fintan O'Toole, the Irish uh, man who was in the show briefly, was that there was this incredible confluence of of, uh, the, 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 there was this group called the House, which basically ran um, you know, everything down there, as far as I understand. Um, and it was run by a group of Irishmen, guys, Civil War vets, who were basically chiseling, uh, kind of running a shady deal with government beef contracts, federal government beef contracts. And they basically had a stranglehold on all the commerce down there. And then this Englishman, John Tunstall, came to town, looking probably for his own piece of the pie, and thought that he needed to start a sort of similar kind of franchise. Um, and he, when he met Billy, he hired Billy. Billy actually uh, had stolen some of his horses. He met Billy in prison. Instead of, instead of asking to have charges pressed against him, he hired him, gave him a job. Because he was looking for tough cowboys himself. But what, was, what would eventually be played out in this Lincoln County War, which I think is fascinating, is this old world Irish-English turf battle. And it's played out in Plains, New Mexico. And I was utterly fascinated by this, this imagining how this was going to, going to play out. And ultimately, Tunstall is the one who, who loses um, to the Irish group, the House. But, but there was a connection to a much larger organization, which I don't go too much into detail about, which was the Santa Fe Ring. And the House was really just a sort of part of this larger cabal of, of Anglo businessmen that had kind of come to this territory and basically took the land by hook or by crook um, and controlled everything. So, so Billy kind of somehow gets swept up into this, this fascinating uh, turn of events in Lincoln County. You make mention, not you, but the film makes mention that not a dime moved in that county that didn't, those cats didn't get a piece of it. They How did they get so big? They, they kept the book. Well, you know, it wasn't, we're talking about everybody that went to the house, my understanding of Paul would give us some more information about this, they kept a book. So if you couldn't afford feed that day, they put your name down, and they kind of owned you. So you kept getting more and more debt to the house. So no matter how big or small you were, all roads led to the house. And eventually they just had a stranglehold on that. They were also doing uh, a lot of things, of cheating the federal government out of the beef contracts, where they would say, somebody was telling me a story recently, that they would show up with, with really giant cows that they would feed and tell the government that this, they would tell the army guys that this is what all my whole herd looks like in turn. The rest of them were all skinny little cows, but they would, they would sell the beef on, you know, based on that idea, and also uh, often underestimate or overestimate the amount of uh, Native Americans they were feeding, things like that. So they, they were making money hand over fist. Interesting. I want to bounce back to you, Paul, on that on the point John made about the Santa Fe Ring. There was a book I uh, read recently. It's called The U.S. Marshals of Arizona and New Mexico from back at that time. Tr terrific book. If anyone's interested in law enforcement side of the territory. It was just an amazing story. But law enforcement's connection to the Santa Fe Ring was, was pretty startling. I mean, everybody seemed like they were in the tank at this point in New Mexico. It's crazy. It, it's a very complex situation with law enforcement in the West. That, that's that's uh, Larry Ball's book on U.S. Marshall. is an excellent book. Yeah, his son is one of my colleagues at the University of New Mexico. Um, the, um, the law is divided. And so what you see, what you see on a small scale in Lincoln County is the county authorities, uh, and then this extra legal uh, group called the regulators that Billy is a part of, and eventually becomes the leader of. Uh, and they're all carrying paper, you know, warrants. And then though you have federal law, and eventually you have federal law coming down against Billy, and uh, on the side of. The, ha uh, the house, but even more so the Santa Fe Ring, which really pulled all the strings of power. Same thing in Arizona, where you have the OK Corral troubles going on right at this exact same time, and the Earps represent federal law, 
while the Cowboys and the Sheriff of Cochise, what becomes Cochise County, represent local law. And you have conflict, and so you actually had Wyatt Earp, Deputy U.S. Marshal, being chased out of Arizona. He came here to Albuquerque, he and Doc Holliday, after they got chased out of Arizona by the local law enforcement. And this this is all tied up too with the legacy of the Civil War and uh, the right and the way the federal the feds were coming down on the South and Reconstruction and the, so folks were very very sensitive about this and often you would see those against the federal authority to be ex Confederates or Texans who would come over a lot of Texans uh, here in New Mexico then and uh, usually they were on the wrong side of the law. <laughs> Mark, the, um, the ability of Billy the Kid to hang, persevere basically through everything, it seems like. And we were talking earlier, we did some taking the KMA earlier. It just seemed like he lived a, a, a tragic life. He was either all alone or in the middle of unbelievable mayhem or he was in jail waiting to, waiting to be hung. It's like those three things. How, what was your sense of him as a person, how he lived his day to day life? Did, when you guys sat down to think about these things? Um, well, you know, that's the goal, actually, is to bring him alive uh, as a human being. Um, not to romanticize him, though. I mean, I think that's always the danger here. And uh, we really tried to steer it clear of being seduced by his youth, you know. I mean, this is, uh, his story really begins when his mother dies, in many ways, his psychological story. You know, it's at, it, he's at an age when, you know, we're today you know, dealing with the big trauma of going into high school. And he's now alone in the wilds of New Mexico territory at that age, trying to not only figure out who he is at 15 to deal with his hormones, but try to stay alive, actually, and survive. And so it's, uh, you know, he grows up quickly. And, um, um, you know, his, his motivation, I think, is a hard thing to get at besides getting by. And if, you, if, you, if you follow him into the Hispanic community, there's another story. And I think there's a story of charm, charisma, um, probably a, a really deep love for Paulita. Um, he's certainly embraced and certainly what has come down through the generations that he, in that community is that he, he embraced us, he spoke our language, he danced with us, he was charming. And we loved him deeply. And so there's a soft side in, in, in that community. Sure. So I think it's almost like a prison that forms around Billy. Almost any direction, facet that you look at, you see a slightly different picture. Yeah. And I, I just want to add, I do think that when, when Lou Wallace, when we were looking at those letters, um, I think when Lou, Lou Wallace ultimately betrays him, it's like you could imagine what a teenager feels like with his own father as a betrayal. I think at that point, all bets are off. And he's determined to do you know, anything that he can to continue to piss off the machine, more or less. Um, and, and, and I realized that and, and he was, most of his life he was swept up in events, but at that moment he had taken real charge. And we saw what happened after. I mean, how aware of his fame do you, do, were you able to determine he might have been in real time? I'm not sure. I, I, I got to believe he was aware of it when he was on the run. And, there, and Kugler and others were writing his articles about him. I think he was very much aware of it. <coughs> Is that your sense as well, Mark? That it, you know? Yeah, I think so. But, you know, going back to John's description of, of the house, you know, the other way to look at Billy the Kid is that he was the first one to, to occupy the house. So we'll bust out the Billy the Kid hashtag. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Paul, do we have any evidence? <clears throat> this is a strange question, but I've always wondered this. Do we have any evidence somehow that Billy might have spoken with Rome? Um, no, not that I've not that I've ever okay. seen. I think people would have mentioned it, and remember, he's once removed, and he's grown up. I mean, he might have spoken actually with with a Hispanic accent more mm -hmm. easily than he would have uh, uh, with any, any any sort of uh, Irish accent. Um, and and remember the attitudes toward the Irish in America at that time, which uh, meant that you tried to lose that accent pretty quick if you. Uh, if you had it now, it's now it's a great, great thing to have, you know. Mm -hmm. and sure, and you can pick up chicks. I guess I don't know, but, but, uh, <laughs> but not so, not so back. He's a teenager. Yeah, not so back. <laughs> you made a Will Arnie. That's right. <laughs>
He may have whooped it on when he needed to, you know what I'm saying? I'm sure I came back when he needed it. Um, your sense of his connection to the Hispanic community here, and in, in perhaps a, a, a need for family, a need for closeness, protection of some sort, what's your take on his getting close to a, a different culture than his own? Well, it's, it's very real, and I think that uh, the way he embraced um, the local Hispanic population, and the way he learned the language and the culture, of course, uh, allowed him, in a practical sense, to have a base that he can operate out of once he didn't become an outlaw. Mm -hmm. But also, long before that, to give him sort of a family connection, because he is uh, really on his, on his own. And he's also, I mean, he's just, every, every hand was sort of against him his whole life. And he was always in trouble, of course. And um, he uh, might well have felt more comfortable amongst those who were in the process of being dispossessed and, uh, and had a community of interest uh, uh, with, with those folks, sure. more so than with, uh, you know, with the tough kind of crowd of uh, cowboys. But he moved pretty easily in that crowd, too. But even in, uh, in Lincoln County, um, the group he ran with were the small ranchers. Um, and um, so he wasn't comfortable, you know, uh, with the big ranchers, with Chisholm and his, his guy. But he was, he was real comfortable with some of the cowboys, uh, you know, down around the mountain and stuff. And so it's just reflective of his uh, personality. And that, that, though, also is the key to his greatness in that, uh, you know, there's history and then there's story. And John does a great job developing story in this, in this film. And, and the kid is just a dream. For a storyteller, and it's just so steeped in romance, and you can't get away from it. I mean, he is the consistent rebel, and he really is a Robin Hood figure. Uh, he he engages in some petty crime, but his major crime is murder. I mean, he but he he's killing for his sense of sort of gun smoke justice, and he feels, you know, why would he not? That that's the only way you can get real justice in a world that he's grown up in of swirling corruption, and in which every adult is uh, completely and totally corrupt. Mm -hmm. Did you, by the way, um, in about 10 minutes, we're going to take some questions from you all. We have a, a microphone right down here in the corner. Um, so, 10 minute warning, and feel free to come down and share your stories. Even if you don't have a question, Mike, you've heard some interesting stories from some folks coming in, some grandparents and great grandparents who may have known him. Interesting. John, did you come to any judgment, final judgment, about Believe the Kid once you got through this project? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I did. I, I think I sort of, what I said is I feel like he really got swept up in events. And it's toward the end of his life when he escapes and he murders the two guards, and um, where I think you know, the die had been cast, as, as Paul said. And, and I see him as a kind of, um, just a rebel character. Finally, it's just an absolute rebel. Did you have a judgment of him before you started the film? I didn't. I didn't know much about Billy the Kid. I knew the name, um, but I hadn't seen or read much about him. I didn't, it wasn't somebody who'd seen Young Guns. I know that was the sort of last big Hollywood movie, and I wasn't aware of it, or Young Guns too. Um, and, and so, which, which I often like those kinds of stories because they're just in the periphery of, our, of, of the rest of the country, sort of imagination. And you know the name, but you know, I, I assumed he was like a Jesse James kind of character, a uh, robber. Yeah, um, but what I found was obviously something so much more rich. Mm -hmm. Another interesting character in the film is Pat Garrett, certainly. And your sense of him, Mark, um, when you when you consider him as a lawman slash. Climber, social climber, slash. I mean, there's a lot of pieces to him. He's kind of an interesting guy in his own, in his own sense, yeah. Yeah, and I think, um, actually, Garrett posed some problems for us, and I think Paul sort of uh, alluded to, um, you know, I think what John's done a really nice job is, you know, um, of, of the 66 feature films and the no numerous books, who knows how many books, you know, the, the density of information that you can pack into even a 250-page book is much, much more than you can into an hour-long film for our series. Um, so you really have to make tough choices about what is the essence of your story, what, you, what trail are you going to follow. And early on, John, you know, I think, um, had conceived of this as possibly these two intersecting lives that came to a head that night um, in the darkness with uh, Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid. And I think that's a wonderful way to tell a story. Um, it, it's just, it came at the expense every time we would 
uh, at least on paper, go away and develop pet hairs for a little bit further along, we lose a little piece of Billy the Kid. And there's enough in Billy the Kid, the context, the house, the ring, the, um, his own story, that you really want to have room for that. And so in the end, we decided, um, you know, it, it's a judgment call, but in the end, we decided to have Garrett enter the story when he enters, really, the story of Billy's life when he's on his trail. And um, so there's, uh, there's a lot more about um, Pat Garrett available you know, on our website and in other, in other books. But um, that's, the, that's the, the story choice that she would make. Paul, what was it for, for Garrett? It seems like there was obviously there was a big name to chase and could have made his career. But was there something else going on there as well for Garrett? This guy looks like a hellman for leather you know, personality here. He was a tough guy. He had been a cowboy and a buffalo hunter. He had uh, moved easily in the lawless society of uh, both Texas and, uh, and New Mexico. Um, that's why they wanted him a sheriff. He was sort of Chisholm's hand-picked man. Uh, his, his job was to bring law to Lincoln County. And um, even before he was sworn in as sheriff of Lincoln County after the election, he was made a deputy U.S. Marshal. They just crossed out the name of the guy they already had there, wrote his name in, and he carried these warrants in his pocket. And, and they weren't really uh, legal warrants, they were hunting licenses. And he went out and he, uh, and the two pals of Billy that he killed, you know, had committed no murders. They were not, uh, you know, vicious characters. Uh, and uh, he simply executed them. And, uh, that was his job, and he felt that he would find a place in territorial uh, society and become an important man in New Mexico. It came to haunt him, though. He's a very tragic character, because he, right away he had to write an autobiography, you know, a book about how he killed Billy the Kid, called The Authentic Life of Billy the Kid, because people were criticizing him for gunning the kid down in a darkened room. Many said, of course, the kid didn't have a gun, and I don't believe the kid had a gun. If, there, if the kid had had a gun, there would have been another dead Lincoln County Sheriff uh, that night. But uh, Garrett uh, went on uh, to some fame, um, but uh, his life kind of fell apart. Eventually, he's murdered down by uh, Las Cruces by the very same people that had hired him to kill the kids. So, uh, oh, no kidding. I didn't know that. Oh, that absolutely. Fell. The same. Yeah, the same. He came back to New Mexico to try to win Spurs back as a lawman, <coughs> investigating a very famous murder here. In fact, the, the murder was of uh, Judge Fountain, who had been one of the lawyers for Billy. And this is all caught up with the Catherines and with the power play in New Mexico. And even Albert Fall, uh, who goes on to be uh, the Secretary of the Interior during the Teapot Dome scandal, another famous New Mexican, for all the wrong reasons, uh, was involved in that in a very uncomfortable way. And Garrett was, uh, was shot in the back of the head, and um, uh, the man was acquitted. Uh, and it was self-defense, they said. <laughs> so, uh, how else would you shoot Pat Garrett but in the back? He'd kill you if he tried to shoot you in the front. I mean, it was kind of... Uh, so, uh, and, of course, his daughter wrote our state song. So there you go. <laughs> John, your, your take on Pat Garrett. I don't want to stick with him for a little bit. Uh, you know, besides trying to wedge him in there, they're both, both so interesting. But his motivation, his emotional... Tick that he worked. I think he was a man who wanted who wanted to be famous. I mean, I think he wanted to be known as a famous lawman. And what we learned about his biography, had I done that, my original conception of it, um, you know, was that he was very much like Billy. I mean, he you know he, he was a guy who lost I think his family at a young age. Um, they were wealthy, much wealthier than Billy, but then lost a lot in the Civil War. And he came out. And he killed a man. Uh, as a young man over an argument in a campfire, very similar to Billy's first murder. So I, I started to see a lot of similarities to them. Uh, and especially once their lives came together, they're both sort of, you know, Billy was reading his own press, um, and, and Garrett wanted to be famous. So, so it seemed like the right way to go. It was impossible to do in 52 minutes that you, you, know, you have to tell the story. But I think that, um, it, it, as, as Paul alluded to, that his death was ignominious, you know, and I think that he kind of was, you know, came to be seen as America's lawman, um, but then kind of couldn't control his own vices and sort of became, uh, Paul said, he was taking a, he was urinating, isn't that right? On the I was going to leave that detail out. <laughs> <laughs> Storytelling. <laughs> 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 
Yes, he was, which makes it even, even, you know, more difficult right. with the self-defense. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and he had this they have claimed the he had a gun with his hand. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you see what happens when you open that door. <laughs> Anytime anybody wants to have something to say, please do come down to the microphone. Just go ahead and work your way down now. Sometimes it can take a little bit of ruffling and getting by people. That's okay. Michael, in the white shirt, you know, he'll just set up at the right height for the microphone and everything. John, where should we, you know, we, again, talking earlier, turning the page on building the kid, is that really possible? No, and, I don't think so. And, that, and that's certainly not my intent here. Was, you know, I think there'll be many Billy the Kid uh, kids coming down the line, you know. Um, for each generation, there'll probably be a different Billy the Kid. I think there have been. You know, Newman's Billy the Kid was very different from Emilio Estevez. You know, I mean, I think they're gonna, they're always gonna be uh, different. And like I said, I just tried to find the humanity in, in, in the kid. Um, I, it, it, what is left out of the film, I really would encourage everybody to read um, Paul Hutton. And, and if you want to learn more about the Lincoln County War, Frederick Nolan's book was like a Bible and a guide book. Um, it is such a, uh, the Lincoln County War is so, there's so many entangling lines, it's, a, it's an incredible story, and we encourage you to, to read more, and learn more about it for that. Yeah. Just before we get to these guys, let some more folks get in. Mark, for you, in your hopes for this as a broadcast, internationally, I gotta think, America, you guys gotta be excited about this one, so a lot of legs around the world for this one. Well, absolutely, I mean, just to repeat, it's gonna be on January 10th, at 8 o'clock, so um, we're really excited about that. It repeats a bunch of times, which I should know, but I haven't, but I haven't been able to remember all the times. So I'm sure you'll be playing quite a bit. And you know, it's part of this package of these um, iconic Western figures that Paul and at the very beginning. So I think, you know, if, you, if this is the type of history because of where you live or because, you know, what you're interested in, that you're interested in each one of these stories is quite different. And I think, um, you know, I think that this has tremendous... You know, the other thing that sort of really stimulated me to decided to commission this uh, John Mekas film is um, early on uh, I realized that you know Billy the Kid is one of those names and Paul you probably know this better than anyone but it's it's a name that becomes um, if you if you know one or two names from American life and you're in some remote part of the world it, the odds are that Billy the Kid is one of them <laughs> and you can you can do sight gags with it. You can do far sight cartoons. You know, Billy the Kid. I mean, it always works. And, and that's the real power of popular culture. When you're when Carson was doing jokes about you on the Tonight Show, and you'd been dead 150 years, right. you knew you'd right. made it. Right. right. So we're I'm, I'm, you know we're optimistic that uh, the big audience, not only in the West, but um, you know we're uh, I also across the country because I think he is one of those characters that America throws up that really comes to symbolize the country as a well. whole. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Let, let me just add, too, if I could, that um, this is a real treat, I think, for New Mexico to have this uh, film made. Uh, someone who has some experience with documentary filmmaking, uh, American experience is absolutely the gold standard. It's just so wonderful. And <laughs> Very sensitive to the people in the landscape of New Mexico, so this is a, a great uh, sort of loving postcard to the world about New Mexico. Thank you. Sir, your name and your name? I'm David Lucero. I'm native New Mexican, born here in Albuquerque. And uh, when I was growing up, we never knew anything about Billy being friendly with Mexicans. Didn't know that that was an issue. But what I'm getting from Seeing hearing you and seeing other things I've read, uh, it's kind of like Saint uh, Saint um, Francis of Assisi, who is supposed to be the patron saint of animals and animal love, but really was quite a, a patron of the poor. And was a very powerful man in the medieval period in church. Life. I'm thinking that the same kind of thing has happened to Billy. We didn't know that he was a friend of Spanish language and culture and people. And I'm wondering if you just have any sense of that kind of a mechanism that Assisi suffered with Billy. I really defer to all disappointed Billy for all these years. <laughs> um, well, I'm not, an ex I'm not an expert on um, on Catholic saints, but um, <laughs> but I think your point's well taken, and I think that uh, especially for 
a filmmaker or for a, a historian with a romantic bent, um, the fact that Billy is the champion of the board uh, really works uh, to the benefit of the story. And it's one of the reasons that, that his story continues. And I, I, it's one of the reasons I've never cared at all, uh, despite the PBS show on Jesse James, I've never cared much for Jesse James as a story because he really was a real outlaw. But the kid, uh, just I just got swept up in that story because he, he truly is the consistent rebel, the Robin Hood uh, character, and it's real. The, the, there's a manufactured Robin Hood quotient to the Jesse James story, but with the kid's story, I, he's the real thing. Really. Yeah, there's a real humanity there, and I think that I think that he, in fact, was tied up with the with the Hispanic community uh, by by just the fact that he lived and he was amongst them. And, embraced them and was looking for home. But I think afterwards, they have come to also see the mythic Billy the Kid as the sort of saint-like figure, I think, from, for, for a lot of people, um, from, from the stories I was hearing. And he dies for love. He can't stay away. Yeah, with exactly. Him. I mean, that, it's Hispanic lady. So, right? <laughs> Good evening, gentlemen. My name is Ron Perea, a lifelong New Mexican. In high school, I even dated Pat Garrett's granddaughter. <laughs> So it's been ingrained in me. So a uh, New Mexican and American conspiracy theory. Bushy Bill Roberts, true or false? <laughs> false. <laughs> Dracula, he keeps rising from the grave. So, like every 15 years, we have to put a new stake, you know, through his heart. You know, it's um, we've done a number of uh, films on subjects like JFK's assassination that we've been, and you know, it, America does throw up some really good conspiracy theories and some great and some crazies and some things. But you know what? Um, I really have been impressed, and I can just even see this the symbol. This is this line. Billy the Kid's alive in this state. He's really, this is not the past. This is still flowing, still coursing through the hills here. And, and it's really great to see people who are really in touch with and feeling that, you know, the present really is formed by the past. And we really cannot understand the present without really feeling the past, you know, because we're, we're really shaped by and, and uh, influenced by and really are here because of that past. And, and, and I just really commend all of you for being engaged with the past because it's easy to dismiss and say that was then and we're overwhelmed with now and I, I don't care about the past. Please. I could talk about the kid for hours, but I just wanted to um, make one quick little statement is on his picture he looks a little inebriated. <laughs> <laughs> and second of all, with his love of family and the Hispanic community, what happened to little brother Joe? And why wasn't he close with him? That's a good question. I, I've never really fully understood uh, where, where he went. Uh, he seems to disappear after after Silver City, at least in my understanding of it. But, uh, it wasn't, I think there's a story that he reappeared in Colorado or something. And somebody he did. He reappeared in a saloon in Colorado and yeah. was interviewed by a newspaper reporter who asked him, Almost nothing of value. It's just incredible. Yeah, he didn't know. It's one of those great, you know, missed opportunities. Yeah. Yeah. He didn't know it was Billy the Kid's. The reporter didn't know it was Billy the Kid's brother. Yeah, no, he did. He did. He, oh, was, he, did. he was. He was. But he he just didn't ask very very meaningful questions okay. of him. And, right. uh, so Actually, that, he said, "Who cares?" Oh, yeah, there you go. Who cares? Who cares? <laughs> on, the, on the photo front, Paul well, me if I'm wrong. Um, I, I swear I read that you know. <coughs> The photo seems to stand for the opposite of everything that's attributed to Billy. He's handsome, and charming, and he's, he's leaning back there with a the kind of buck teeth, and he does, you know, look a little tipsy or whatever it is. But there's something about the, you know, the process of that. Um, I think it's a is a daguerreotype or tintype camera. Tintype. It's a tintype. At that time, that it just sold for a million dollars. Or was it two? I don't even. I can't keep my million straight. <laughs> But it's a it's a difficult process to stand for that in the eighteen eighties, and um, I mean it's not difficult, but it takes it takes a while. And, and there's the other way to read it is there's a, a nervousness and sort of a flightiness about Bill, and, he's, and it maybe doesn't capture who he who he really is, other than a slight awkwardness of, of coming in and getting in for the only time in his life coming in and getting his, his image. And 
there's also, if you have studied the photo, uh, which unfortunately I do, uh, you can, you can, and in, indeed on the images we have here, you could really see well. Um, you can see a hand which is holding, he's holding a reflector so that the light comes in. And at Billy's feet, you can see the metal stand that went up behind him and clamped his neck. So, because you had to be perfectly still for the photograph. That's why it's so difficult for people. That's why you never see Lincoln smile. It's so difficult in, because of the time involved to hold a smile in one of those uh, in one of those old uh, photographs. I love that photo because he's wearing everything he owns. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. and the fact that he's got a cardigan sweater on just drives me nuts. So <laughs> just like, the greatest outlaw in American history is wearing his cardigan. <laughs> And it's best under that. It must have been a day like this, you know, in scarves. Please. I, a, I always thought he was front in the photo anyway, trying to look all cool with a <laughs> big bracket on his neck. Okay. Um, but my question is more with the production of the piece. I actually live on the weekends and work in Lincoln County mm -hmm. and have become very familiar with the area. Do you end up shooting in Lincoln where you're discussing between the Valley of Fire and the Mescaleros and what the town yeah. of Lincoln is? And I, I just noticed in the scenery, yeah. in, the, in the production of the filming, that's not Lincoln County. Yes, you're right. <laughs> that's not close to Lincoln County. Yeah, no, no, so do you right. end up filming there? We just haven't seen that part yet. Because yeah. it's such a, I think it's such a beautiful and uniquely different area that it probably did frame and shape a lot of his movements, his travels, and, yeah. and where he went because of just the natural boundaries around him. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, that was always my, all the interviews, uh, I shot a series of interviews in, in Lincoln and in some of the extant buildings that are, that are there. Um, and I've shot interviews around the entire state, but when it came time to shoot the recreations, um, you know, they're, they're incredibly um, uh, expensive. Like you're still there. Oh, no, absolutely, ball. absolutely. But, but, but in, uh, shooting in a controlled environment in, in a short amount of time is incredibly expensive, labor intensive. Experience. And my goal was to shoot in New Mexico at the um, Bonanza Creek Ranch that's, that's here that's obviously hosting a lot of productions. And when I came out to do it, uh, it we got snowed in. Or, you know, snowed and then I couldn't do it, so I had to wait another few weeks. And then it was all muddy when the snow melted, so I, I couldn't shoot her. So I had to move the production to Tucson and shoot in Tucson. So I never got a chance to shoot in, in, up in Lincoln. Yeah. Did you go visit that area? Did oh yeah, I've spent a lot of time there. Yeah. Okay, because it's just so, I think it really did. Yeah. Environment I mean, shapes a lot of who we are. And, and yeah, right. That we no, absolutely. And I think that had a huge impact on Billy's yeah. life and where he absolutely. went and why he went where he went. Well, just traversing that whole, I mean, it's one of the things that I was... Valley Fire alone. Right, when I was drawn to the story was that he, you know, that, that when you, he would ride out of town and ride, I mean, the, the hundreds of miles that he put out on the horseback by himself riding through the plains, I mean, no, I, I totally agree. It was one of the things that, that drew me to the story. Um, it's just, um, for economic reasons, it gets tricky to, to shoot all over the state. It's just how bad the weather is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we really enjoyed our, our trip here because every single New Mexican who's come up to us in the last 48 hours has apologized. Yes, apologize. <laughs> <laughs> I can guarantee you, if you ever go to Boston, no one will apologize. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, some of the old timer the Hispanic, uh, the Hispanic community uh, know or call Billy the Kid a Chibito. Is that um, something you found in your research also? Chibito yeah. means a baby goat, you know, or it's like the kid which has a play, you know. Yeah. And Chibito also has a uh, sense of mischievous person. Oh, right. Somebody who's mischievous. Oh. Like a kid, you call him it's a chivo, you know. He's like a mischievous kid. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you saw that or heard of that. Yeah, uh, Tony Mares, who's in the film, later on in the film, talks about the, the Chivito and El Belito, and he says they called him, and um, he, he was reciting some poems that had been written about him. Um, about El Belito, and, yeah. So no, it was definitely a term of him, I think. Cool. Please. Uh, good evening, I'm Janet Sayers, and I'm with the Historical Society of New Mexico, but I'm also with our Statehood Centennial, and we gladly welcome you to come back in 2012 and experience our 100th anniversary of 
becoming a, a state. Yeah. And there will be thousands of, of stories that will be told next year. But um, I have a philosophical question for you all to respond to. Uh, this audience has a lot of baby boomers, like myself. 60-ish that grew up in the 1950s where you had three television stations and you had westerns and you had comic books and so Billy the Kid was part of um, the genre of my age group. All right, you've got now children and teenagers who probably not only do they not know that name, they don't care because their world <laughs> Their world is hundreds of TV stations and exposure because of the internet and because of information that who knows where it came from, who knows where it's going. Your comment about famous, infamous. My, my philosophical question back to you is the generation of young people growing up now how are they going to define uh, fame, infamy, based on this barrage of the emphasis on entertainment figures and following people that have become famous because um, the media or the, you know what I'm trying to say. They, they become famous because of what we've created. Yes, like Kim Kardashian. <laughs> I'll, I'll wade into that a little bit because I've got a couple of kids in the, in the upcoming generation. Um, with all due respect, you know, I, I can definitely remember my parents saying that my generation was taking America to hell in a hand. <laughs> um, and um, you know, I'm not so sure that the, the lines of good and evil and all that has been changed just by the density of information and, the, and, the, and you know, the emphasis. Of, you know, when I was growing up, the, the definition of a hero was someone who stayed within the lines, the accepted lines of society. And my generation was part of trying to erase those lines or challenge those lines, and that was very threatening. Um, so. I think there's always that turmoil between generations, and I think you know this is a, a really challenging time informationally and, uh, for these kids. You know they're dealing with multiple screens and multiple inputs, and and it is hard to find bottom uh, right now for reality, which is um, you know we even have a whole genre of television that's called reality that's about everything but reality. Uh, so I think it's but they're sophisticated, and you know I've got a lot of faith in them. They're going to be able to weed out what's real from what's not real, what's lasting from what's ephemeral, and, and they're smart as you know. And, uh, you know, and uh, I, th I think we're in good hands. You know. How do you see that, Paul? Do you see Billy's thing growing, shrinking? What, what's your sense of it? Well, there were 47 uh, primetime Western shows on the three networks in 1959, uh, including Clue Gulliver as Billy the Kid and the Tall Man. Barry Sullivan is, is back there. It didn't last very long. Ratings killed the kid before Garrett did. <laughs> the, there's an interesting problem that, that I think a lot about as a teacher. And uh, I think about especially if you, I'm often asked to come talk about Billy the Kid to, uh, to a high school audience, for instance, or a middle school audience. My wife teaches for APS. Um, now, one, I'm scared of that audience, of course, because I live in a controlled environment as a college professor. But, but even more so, here's the problem for, for a historian, for a writer, for a filmmaker, trying to deal with the story of Billy the Kid and make him heroic. You're always a little uneasy. I mean, here's, here's Peter Pan morphing into Robin Hood. Uh, here's someone who not only disobeyed adults, but shot them. And when you're dealing with the sort of world we live in today, the environment you live in today, it's, it, it's a little uncomfortable to try and make that character a heroic, positive character for young people. And so that's the challenge. That's the challenge you have. And I think that you fall back on the romance of the story to, uh, to do that. And, uh, and Billy is a fighter for justice. That's a good answer. That's interesting. Please. My name's Bob Smith. Um, first of all, I'd like to compliment you from what I've seen here so far tonight. I can't wait to see the whole show. Um, that's great. I have a report.
request, and, and this may be something that you've already done and I missed. If that's the case, I apologize in advance, but uh, I just recently read a couple of biographies of El Fago Baca. I would love to see a documentary on this probably just as important character to New Mexico as Billy the Kid, perhaps even more so. So that's my request. <laughs> Came up today. It came up today. It's not the first time it's come up. Today. So, uh, point noted. Yeah. Thank you. And finally, did I hear correctly at the beginning of the American Experience documentary that Silver City is in the southeastern part of the <laughs> Well, um, you know, I was reading the, rereading the script on the plane on the way down here, and I and, um, having just been not far from Silver City just a few days ago. That, I just kind of went, oh. <laughs> <laughs> but here's, here's, here's what we're going with, okay? Remember, New Mexico is a territory, right? So where is that Western territorial line? You know, it's it's a started to publish a few things. Most of the stuff that I write is for an emerging kind of ensemble called the Guitar Orchestra. They're starting to become very popular around. And uh, I got, I had the great uh, pleasure of being invited to Norway to do, uh, uh, to do some work there in a culture school in Bergen, Norway, which is the home of the composer Edvard Grieg. Um, and the people at the school said, well, why don't you I was to write something for them. And they said, why don't you write something from New Mexico? And so I racked my brain. There are, there are a lot of wonderful things, but um, uh, it was at exactly the same time that an incredible show at the Albuquerque Museum was mounted about Billy the Kid. I think you had a lot to do with that. Um, and so I visited that. It was such a transformative experience to see the stuff that was there that I went home and probably in about four days wrote three movements of a, of, of a work uh, that was called Three Meditations on Billy the Kid in the Lincoln County War. Um, I mailed the score to them and uh, a couple of months before I was to go so that they could work on it. And uh, when, when I got there, um, I, was, I was sort of besieged not with musical questions as much as historical ones. So, you know, I was on <laughs> I was the computer uh, at night, you know, before these rehearsals, kind of boning up on Billy the Kid, and trying to learn as much as I possibly could, because the questions that I was getting were, showed an incredible interest. The concert had more people in it than they ever had for one of those concerts, and it wasn't because of me. It was a, because of the fact that there was something about Billy the Kid there. So just to show that it was an incredibly, it, it is an incredibly international phenomenon. It, it's just an incredible, that, that, that one work, however, has proven to be the best one that I have in my catalog because of, of that calling card, too, I think. Thank you, Paul. I appreciate that very much. Yeah. That's a great story. Good for you. Yeah, a great experience. similarities between probably the stories mom told me from the Irish culture. That they're a culture of great storytelling and the, of leaving the famine and a traditional dislike of their English neighbors. Um, and maybe he saw some similarities from the stories he heard from mom, etc. growing up. 
in, in the community that's related to here. That's uh, very likely. I mean, I, I, my understanding is that they were very close, and I think she was a sort of real um, storyteller herself. So it's likely, yeah, I can see how that would, that would be, uh, be true. Hmm. What are we a little bit further on the woman that he captured his uh, attention? His love life. What was going on there? I'll leave the maximum. Well, I mean, you know, Paul would like you to weigh on this. I mean, I feel like we, we, we take a line that he was, in fact, in love with this woman. But later on in life, she denies that, that the, the, what she says is that the, the, the picture of Billy was not a good likeness of him, but that there wasn't any romance. And that may have been, I think people speculate that it's because she was a proper Victorian woman, he didn't want to, want to go there, but, but it's, it's unclear. But it seems to me that there was a true romance. Oh yes, I think uh, there was, and um, he was there to see her, and it really looks like uh, uh, her older brother Pete is the one who told him yes. that the kid was going to be around there, and sort of dropped the dime on Billy, and uh, that's how we are to be laying in wait uh, for him to uh, to kill him in whatever manner he did. I'm not quite sure Garrett's story. It's the only story we have, but I'm not quite sure that's the correct story, but uh, certainly he was there to see her, and uh, alas, uh, that only helps us with the story, because it's, right. so, it's, it's so wonderful. But he was very, very popular with the ladies, which belies that photograph. Uh, yeah. I don't think that's Girl a good photograph. Like yeah. Did you all hear that? The charm is as important as good looks. <laughs> 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 I'd like to uh, thank these guys for making this modern day documentary. I don't think there's one been made since National Geographic. There were like eight, ten years ago, I believe it was. Um, you know, it's a good thing for the state. You know, you know, it's getting national exposure, bringing tourism to the state, continues to promote tourism. I actually became um, a fan of Old Kid at a young age. My father was born and raised in Fort Sumner, so we always went back to go visit. And I always used to see this cowboy, and I'm like, that's all Fort Sumner has. Uh, it's a tiny town, it's completely missing. <laughs> Just seeing the museums and where he's buried and stuff like that. I'm such a fan and, and believe in so much everything that uh, Billy did. I even have him tattooed. <laughs> <laughs>